what is generativity? Oh my gosh, I can't, I'm excited to talk about this because it's connected to everything and it's still connected to mentorship. So um, generativity is something we're built to do just like walking and talking. So most of us think of our physical trajectory in life as one where we increase in our abilities very rapidly. You learn how to walk and talk and you get fast at running and you do all these things. And then at a pretty early age, you start to have a slow and steady decline. Now, we, that's how we think of aging. What we don't think about is our emotional trajectory. And on that, it starts at birth just the same as we do with our physical trajectory, but it increases and never declines. So right in the middle of that um, trajectory, when we're in midlife, is a, a stage called generativity. And this is one where we have a desire to give back to others without expecting anything in return. So imagine yourself as a kid, that's like an unimaginable thing. You can't imagine saying, yes, take my knowledge and expertise and don't give me anything in return. When we're young, we're expected to take in everything around us and absorb. That's what we're doing when we're younger. We're checking off all the boxes in life. I need to you know, get a college degree or I need to become an expert in something, whatever it is, get a house, buy a car, um, whatever those things are in our life, we're checking those boxes. When we hit midlife, we want to be able to share that with others because otherwise all of those boxes that we spent our whole life checking don't matter. So it's the point in our life where we say, do I matter? Do I, does, does me being in this world have any meaning? Did I make any difference? Was there a footprint left? So it's not just a legacy. It's really that we're trying to be able to make meaning out of our life. So if somebody, if we have an opportunity as a grandparent to say, pass down the values, the Thanksgiving dinner that everybody says, this is the same one I've eaten every year. Um, those traditions, those are passed down because we want to make sure that a little bit of what we did is passed down. If it's work, it might be that you're passing on something that you know you came up with, you thought of, that you did, and now you're letting somebody else do it. They hold on to that, which is then you living on in that. So it's really one of the most important stages we can reach, which is generativity. And um, I just wanna make one distinction most people think of generativity as being generous, and it's not. There's a difference. If you go and you get an ice cream cone and somebody gives you an extra scoop of ice cream, they're being generous. But once you eat that ice cream cone, it's gone. But once you are generative and you give away a piece of your knowledge or your values or meaning um, or those traditions, it lives on in the world forever. And that is why generativity is so important to all of us. And the three ways we engage in it are mentoring, volunteering, and philanthropy. Stigma and mental health issues. Now, let me preface this by saying, I have seen some stuff recently because I get my, somehow the algorithm on YouTube, because I'm on there so much now, has started pushing a lot of this relationship stuff to me. And I've seen some of these relationship quote unquote experts talking about why therapy is not good. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> therapy saved my life. I mean, I've said that many, that's why being a mental health advocate on our radio program is so important. So Deb, this one is really important to me because the stigma of mental health issues is still very relevant. Is it not? Can you talk about that, please? Absolutely. It's relevant. You know, when I was working in aging, I, I had a hard time calling myself Dr. Heiser because people thought, oh, no, I'd rather have a brain tumor than someone, you know, think that I'm seeing a psychologist. So um, the, it's always been a big issue, particularly with specific age groups. Um, more so I see with people who are late midlife and beyond. Um, that's still holding strong. And it's tough because, you know, you can, mental health is something that is fluid. You can go through something and get over it. Uh, you don't, you don't want a big physical problem if you can have it. You know, it's much easier to get over something 
that you might be feeling like a depression or an anxiety, something like that. Um, so it's really important that we get good mental health information out there so people can see that, you know, if you're older and you suffer from diabetes or you have a stroke or you have heart issues, you are far more likely to suffer from depression. And it can manifest in ways that look like physical issues. So a person can be really reluctant to go talk to somebody because it's manifesting as a backache, a headache, things like that, that um, general fatigue. And so knowing what we can expect can help us so that we, if we are suffering, we can get over it quicker. Or if we know that it exists, if we can prepare for it so that we can look for the signs or symptoms very early. Yeah, it's a, it's a big issue. Talk about Imagine Age, because Imagine Age was one of the shows that we did early on as well. And that was something that drew me to you. What, what, did, what did you learn from Imagine Age? I, you know, just this just makes my heart go pitter patter when I think about it, because that was started with my dad. Um, my dad passed away last year, but it was started with him. He and I would work late at night on the website. And it was really, it came from, I was working in a really sort of an academic environment in research and nobody outside of research was hearing about anything. This is also how stigma happens. You know, people talk about all the research things, everybody pats themselves on the back and uh, goes to a conference and talks about things and it wasn't making it out into the, into the public. So I wanted to create something that was gonna talk about aging in a way that would talk about finances and um, health and medicine and everything you could ever think of with regard to age and put it out there in a positive way. And so that website was started back when people really, it was kind of a new thing to put out a, a website that had blogs on it and things like that. And it really was a great, I loved that website. It did a great job of bringing really important information to um, individuals and to companies. I found out that companies were using that information so that it was really helping with pharmaceutical companies and other places that needed to have good information on, on positive aging. Healthy dependency, healthy dependency. Now that was show number five. I don't even, I kind of don't remember this one, frankly. It's like healthy dependency. How, what were we talking about there? Do you have any idea what the heck we were talking about? You know, I don't remember, but I can, I can, I can take a stab at what I think this was. You know, we all think we have to be independent and doing things all by ourselves. And a lot of times we really need help from others. And there's a healthy way to get that dependency. You know, everybody hears about codependency and, and, and that's not thought of as being a healthy dependency. A healthy dependency is one where you're really looking to somebody to support and to be there for you as needed, but without you relying on them to get things done. So an example of that might be like when we brought my mother-in-law in to live with us, that was not an unhealthy dependency. That was, you know, she needed some support, but we really gained also from that. That wasn't an enmeshment, that wasn't a codependency. It was a thought out, planned out process where we all moved out of our homes in together. So when you think of healthy dependency, it's really important not to think of ourselves in sort of pillars where we're dependent or independent. There's a continuum. And we always wanna make sure that we are not so independent that we are not gonna ask for help from anybody, but also that we're not so dependent on people that we can't do things by ourselves. So healthy dependency is being able to rely on others, um, but with while still maintaining um, independence. Are you ready to retire? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, since I talk about retirement all the time, and I have a show that I gave to you that said, are we ready to retire? Well, there you go. That's that's a full show in itself. Go ahead. Take, take okay. the next few minutes. That is a full show. You know, I love this one because a lot of people have a real, even today it's, it's gotten better, but it had always been the idea that retirement was golf. I don't know why golf became the big thing that everybody had in their mind that they were going to go play golf, but golf was, I guess the idea that vacation is what um, 
retirement is all about. But as everybody knows, when you take a two week, two week vacation, you get excited to come home and have your head on that pillow and be at home again into your routine. And that happens in retirement. So what I've always said is to plan for your retirement in advance. And this even goes for people like teachers or firefighters or police officers or military personnel who retire at an earlier age. Um, you need to prepare for that. And the reason is you have a, you may not have anything in mind about where, what retirement is and you say, I'm going to go wing it. Or you might have an idea in mind and it, that, that doesn't map out for you. Um, but the emotional stuff is one of the, you know, one of the things that people forget to tell people that they need to think of. We all know, okay, plan for your finances for retirement, but emotionally we need to be thinking of what do we expect to be doing? Where do we expect to be doing it? How often do we expect to be doing it? Because there's no one I've ever met who wants to spend 20 hours of their day golfing. They want to do things, they want to matter, they want to have purpose, they want to have value, they want to make a difference in the world. But they may say, I need to make money. And retirement is an opportunity for a lot of people to do what they've always wanted to do, even if that means a job. So you might be an artist who says, I'm gonna go drive a bus so I can go watch all the football games from the field all across the country. You might wanna go do Habitat for Humanity. You might want to do anything you thought you couldn't do when you were younger because of time or money that you can now do. So prep in advance for what you want to do in retirement emotionally. Deb, how would you like people to get a hold of you? Dr. Deborah Heiser, how would you like people to connect with you? Oh, there's lots of ways. Uh, you can connect with me at mentorproject.org, at deborahheiser.com on LinkedIn, Deborah Heiser. You can reach me um, on Substack, on Psychology Today. So those are both my name. Uh, those titles for those are The Right Side of 40. So those are all great ways to reach me. And um, I hope that you'll also check me out on Amazon because I have a book coming out called The Mentorship Edge. And I hope you'll find me there as well. Bullying in adulthood, bullying in adulthood. Please, Deb, there's a, so much to discuss here. Oh my goodness, there's so much. I mean, if you go on social media, you know, Facebook or any of the others, you can see people really laying into other people and bullying them on Facebook, um, which is just crazy. I think that part of it is like, have you ever driven in a car and somebody cuts you off and you give them the finger and you would never do that in real life. Or, you know, you maybe say something or behave in a way, maybe you then go do something aggressive that you normally wouldn't do. Social media has that anonymity that people often feel in their cars. And so you'll see bullying behavior come out. You'll also see it in um, sporting, especially with kids, you'll see bullying taking place in terms of um, adults with other adults oftentimes and how they behave um, across, you know, if they're at a sporting event, how they may behave with other people. But mostly it's on social media. So I would say, hey, if you're seeing that, get it out of your stream, get away from it. it you know, you do not need that in your life, remove it. Um, and always remember that you may feel anonymous but everybody else is seeing it, it stays forever. So you really want to stay away from it as much as possible. Debbie, first set up something just at a high altitude on the book, why this book and why it's relevant. Let's just start right there. I, I really believe that a lot of people throw around the word mentor without understanding the complexities of it. Mentorship isn't just putting two people together and saying, now here you you take from the expertise of this person. When most people talk about mentorship, they're talking about a mentee who they're who is looking for a mentor. And that mentor is a nameless, faceless individual that most people are thinking of. You know, when you think of mentorship, you're usually picturing the mentee and the benefits to that mentee. And I really wanted to flip the switch and look at mentorship from the 
from the mentor's perspective and looking at it like we're built to want to give back, but we're wasting our most precious natural resources, which is the people who can give back. So mentoring requires people being able to find those they want to mentor and the mentees who are looking to be mentored. So I talk about all the different ways in the book about how we find each other. And most of us think that mentorship is hierarchical, that you it's a, it's a highway in one direction up and down, and it's how you get promoted at work. And we usually think of it only in terms of work, but some of our biggest, most amazing things that we've had happen, which is the founding of our country, the tech revolution, all sorts of things have happened from lateral mentors. And lateral mentors are pretty much everyone we know. If you look to your left or you look to your right, you're gonna be seeing a mentor. And so I talk about some of the things about what mentoring is and isn't and how we can access those people who are next to us. So. An example is Charlie Camarda. He's an astronaut. He went into space and he went right after the mission Columbia that, that um, where all of them perished upon re-entry to earth. And he got up into space and found out that they were having the same problem that Columbia was. And they didn't know they would get to come back home. They were fine where they were, but they knew that re-entry back into earth could cause their, um, their, space their their um shuttle to explode. yeah so what happened was he called a mentor from space you know on a phone like called his mentor and it was a lateral mentor this was a friend of his who didn't work with him but he said tell me straight am i gonna die and or what is there something we can do and this lateral mentor this friend of his who he trusted who he knew would tell him the truth said you got to do a spacewalk you got to get somebody out there to fix this little tiny tile that it was the demise of the previous mission. They did that and they returned home safely. So people don't think of that as a lateral mentor, but Charlie didn't have that expertise. His friend did. And we all have friends who have different expertise than we have. And so the book talks about how we can um, utilize those around us in work and in our personal development to make our lives much happier. Dr. Deborah Heiser is absolutely, I got to pause. Without Dr. Deborah Heiser, there is no show. She was the first guest who believed in me. You got to find people who believe in you. So that's why I have her come on and do the season kickoff because Dr. Deborah is incredible and she's been so loyal to us and love her so much. And it's just been so much fun. So I hope you get a chance to get her book and check things out. And uh, again, thank her for kicking off season 14 and thank you all for subscribing, doing what you do. I'm very, very grateful until next time. Peace out. Love you. I'm Papa Tom. This has been the Tom Matt show.